chapter 3. As I think everyone knows, we've been looking at the Bible dispensationally, trying to get a grasp of how a dispensational understanding of God's unfolding revelation and his plans for these different time eras and the people in them helps you understand what's happening in your Bible when you read it. <clears throat> I believe that there is no doctrine for understanding the Bible more important than understanding dispensations. Now, it's not, uh, it's, it's not alone in that. Understanding preservation and inspiration and those things, it, obviously without those, you don't have a Bible, right? Um, so there are other doctrines that matter. Understanding that we have to compare Scripture with Scripture, that we have to get context right, but that's part of the context is understanding the dispensations and what's happening in them. Now, we saw in the beginning of Acts here in chapters 1 and 2, we saw that the Lord gave the Great Commission to the church, um, or the, the disciples he had gathered, and told them to wait in Jerusalem until um, they were endued with power from on high, and that that power would be so they could be witnesses of him, starting in Jerusalem and Judea, right? But it was going to extend to the uttermost parts of the earth. It certainly began where Israel was. And then it says he's, he was teaching them things about the kingdom of God, which has to do with truly saved people. Their question for him was, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? They wanted to go back to the promise of John the Baptist. This, that, that was the focus of his preaching, was the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent. And the Lord, of course, preached that himself. He also preached other things, but he did preach that. He was the king, and, and now that he was resurrected, the disciples thought, all right, now it's time to show those stiff-necked Pharisees and Sanhedrin and all of them. Go straighten them out, Lord. But that's not that wasn't his plan, right? If you think about it, had he done that, think of the literally millions and millions of people who would not have been saved. Right. We call this age the church age, but it's also called the age of grace. And the reason it's called that is it's called that in, in Ephesians, but it's also because of the fact that the gospel was opened to all the Gentiles of the world. Now, and that was purely an act of grace. That was not a promise. That wasn't the fulfilling of any covenant. That was just God being gracious. Amen. And so all of this would have been lost. Had he set up the kingdom then, none of us would have ever existed. Right? Um, instead, we get to go to heaven and live with God for eternity. Amen. And so it wasn't his plan at that time, but that's how they were thinking. They weren't thinking about a church pulled out of Israel and mixed with Gentiles and Samaritans. Right? They were not thinking about that. Now, I think they should have been, because if you read the Gospel of John, it's clear Jesus was reaching out to everybody. Okay? Um, and I'm sure he was teaching them that to some degree, but like a lot of things, it wasn't getting through. You remember when he told them he was going to have to die and, and rise again, and they just wouldn't accept it? They wouldn't believe it? They fought with him about it? And even after he died, they didn't expect him to rise again? Things were hard to get through to, to, to people who don't want to hear it. And, and it was pre it's pretty clear they really didn't understand what was happening. But they were obedient. He told them uh, to wait in Jerusalem, and they did uh, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came and formed that first church out of the people that were waiting there. There were 120 in the upper room, and, and he melded them into the first church and filled all of them with power, not just the apostles, all of those people that were there, because they went out and spoke in tongues. And we see that some of them, uh, like Stephen, for instance, who wasn't one of the apostles, he does miracles, right? And what was that all about? Well, we talked about this. Israel had been promised miracles, signs, okay, to verify that the message was from Jehovah. And we saw in the first two chapters, this is all Israel. 
There's not a single mention of any Gentiles. He's preaching to Jews. It's only Jews that get saved. And so this first day when, was it 3,000? Uh, yeah, about 3,000, verse 41, uh, were added to them. Those are all Jews who got saved. Okay, these are the people that Hebrews is written to. All right? And so then we get into chapter 3. Uh, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Notice they're still going to the temple. Now, there's no record that they gave any sacrifice or anything like that. But they went to the temple to pray in accordance with the Jewish prayer schedules. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now, what happened when Christ was crucified? What happened inside the temple? The veil got torn in two. So is there any point in going to that building ever again? Until the Lord reestablishes a new temple, which he will in the kingdom, until that happens, is there any point in going to that building? It's done. The way is open. Okay? But like all things, they, you know, they didn't understand these things, and it took time, and it took, took experience, it took revelation, uh, before they could really grasp what God was doing. So they're going to the temple, and they see this man who has been lame from his mother's womb. So what does he do? He lays at the gate of the temple and he begs. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to be mean or, or put him down at all. He was lame. And it was the responsibility under the law of healthy Israelites to support and uh, keep safe and healthy and fed and clothed those Israelites who were not. Okay, so this is perfectly legitimate. And in verse 3 it says, Who seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple asked an alms. So he wanted some money. Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now that's a notable miracle, which we're going to hear them say specifically in a few moments. Okay? They healed a man who had been lame from his mother's womb. We'll find out he's about 40 years old a little bit later in the passage. Been lame since birth. It's like the blind, blind, blind Bartimaeus, right, who had been blind from his mother's womb, and the Lord gave him sight. And remember the Pharisees questioning him? Well, how did he do it? Well, I've told you. <laughs> you know? I mean, he says, what, are you going you gonna to go follow him too? And they, and they get mad at him, and they tell him he doesn't know anything. And he goes, well, one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. You know, that man was not backing down. Those Pharisees put a lot of pressure on They threw him out of the synagogue. Yeah. That doesn't mean out of the building for the moment. It means he was banished from the place where his family and friends went to worship and was told by the people he had spent his whole life with that he was now outside of God. That's what happened to him because he would just not be anything but honest about what Christ had done for him then guess who came and found him? It's one of the very few passages in the Bible where we find Christ going and hunting someone down. But Christ came and found him and brought him to a saving knowledge of who had healed his eyes. Well, that's a notable miracle, much like this. Lazarus was a notable miracle, right? And what was the Sanhedrin's response to that? Did they say, oh, he just raised a dead man. There was no question about that. No one doubted it. No one argued about it. He raised a man who'd been dead for four days. They didn't argue about that. They said, what do we do about it? Well, there's an obvious answer. Only God can raise the dead. Okay, that's all there is to it. The devil can't raise a dead man. If he makes it appear that he has, it's, it's a lie. He's a deceiver. He can't give life to anyone. All he can do is take it, and that only when God allows him to. So what they should have done is repented. It was a sign. It was there. It was clear. We've been wrong to oppose him. This is the Messiah. We should follow him. But instead, they say, this man doeth many miracles, and they decide we have to kill him. 
because they're scared of Rome. And I've said before, and I, I'll say it again, how can you be scared of Rome? Jesus raises the dead. What can Rome do that he can't undo? And if he can do that, I'm certain he can keep him from ever putting you in the grave in the first place. It, it, it was, it's, it's a maddening thing. But that, this is what happens when you won't accept the truth and you want to fight with it and you're committed to a lie, you will believe anything. And you will make the most illogical decisions you could possibly make. And that's what they did. They rejected him. So now we see another one. Now, you're going to notice, uh, the reason I'm setting that context up is because this healing here is a sign. It's a sign God gave Israel that this new church, this new thing he was doing, was of Jehovah. And that if you were going to be a true believing Jew, you needed to leave behind the temple, repent, accept Christ as your Savior, and join this. That was the message of this sign. And we'll see it here in a moment. So he, the first they do that. Um, now, I would say one other thing. I think all of us uh, are familiar with the charismatic movement, right? Pentecostal Assemblies of God. Um, and with people that we love and know are believers who have been tied up uh, in that era. I have many in my own life, friends and family members, and I think others do too. Um, and so when I, when I criticize that false doctrine, because that's what it is, when I criticize that, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody. And there are a lot of truly saved people who've been charismatic and um, I think they're sincere, but they believe false doctrine. And it leads to insane error and crazy behavior. And so often when, it, when a charismatic uh, preacher will cover this passage, they emphasize that this is what they want to do. Right? Well, that's pulling it out of its context. The church hasn't even left Israel yet. There's not a single non-Jew in this church. They're at the temple. There's a man who's been laying there for 40 years. We just got healed. This is assigned to Israel. But they want to produce those same kind of miracles now, here, on earth. Well, have they ever? I mean, did A. Anderson ever heal anybody? He did not. Um, who was that? I can't remember his name. It was a charismatic preacher who had cancer, who was praying about it. And then in Charisma Magazine had a big article about how his wife sat bolt upright one night and told him, God, just give me a word of knowledge. You're healed. And then he died like three weeks later. And this, he just, this was recent. This was in the last five years. And it might have been Harold Camping. Anyway, he was a, 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 you know, one of the big wigs among the charismatic movement. What's that? It might have been. No, that's not it, because I don't know that name. <laughs> um, anyway, and then you have, you have you know, Catherine Coleman and uh, Amy Semple McPherson, and it's often women who lead these things. Um, and I'm not saying that in a degrading way, but the fact is, the Bible's clear, they're not supposed to be filling those roles, but in the charismatic world, they do, all the time. And so, um, error upon error upon error. And, and then they get to the point where they fake these things. Since they can't make it happen for real, they fake it to give faith to the people. That's, that's how, it, you know, how it's described. Um, it, it's bad stuff. But that's pulling this out of its context. This is not something that we can do. Peter was given specific power to do things like this. This is a sign of an apostle, on top of which it's the sign of God's message to Israel. And so this man's healed, and it says in verse 11, um, oh no, I'm sorry, verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Well, who, what people? Well, the people of Israel, right? The people that are in Jerusalem and are around the temple. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man, which was healed, 
held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And so what does Peter do as a result of this? Well, he's going to preach a sermon. He's going to preach a salvation sermon. That's exactly what he does. And this is what the power of the Holy Ghost was given to them for. Jesus said, the Holy Ghost come upon you, you should be filled with power, and ye shall be witnesses of me. That's the purpose of the power. We also have power from the Holy Ghost. We do not have the power to do signs. Those were done. Israel's time passed through the book of Acts. And then the sign gifts were put away, and we'll, we'll, that's covered in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but we do have power, and that power is simply to speak the truth. Okay? Plus, you have direct access to God at any time. You can bring any prayer to Him you want at any time. Now, you've got to make sure you have a clean account with Him. So maybe you've got to fix something between you and Him. But you can do that instantly. Is God slow to forgive? When you ask Him to forgive you, does He say, Well, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe next week. No, this is that's not how he is. He's instant and quick Amen. to forgive. You fix that problem, you can be in front of God at any moment, and he will listen to what you have to say. And he will answer real, honest prayers. And if you're praying for someone to be brought to a saving knowledge of Christ, he's going to do that. Now, whether they repent or not is on them. Right. But he will bring them to the place where they have the, an honest choice to make. And they know they do. He'll do that if you ask him to. That's his will. God, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? If you ask anything according to his will, we know what we have asked, that we have what we have asked. Right? Well, that's according to his will. That, that prayer never goes wrong. So you have power. You do. But it's the power of faith. It's not a power that, that shows itself in a big explosive events. It's a power that you just have to trust God and do what he said he'll do. You won't see most of what he does. You can't see what he's doing in someone's heart. You have no idea. You just have to trust him and believe him. And then you have to give the message, right? And so we have power to do this as well, to be witnesses unto him. But this, their power was special, and it was directed at, at verifying that this was of God for Israel. So in verse 12, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel. So who are the people that ran together? Ye men of Israel. It's important to keep these things in mind. Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? See, he takes no credit for this. Okay? Uh, Peter, Peter made some mistakes in his life, but I'm going to tell you, he is a better man than I am and than probably anyone I know. And he, I'll tell you, especially early here in Acts, his sermons, they're stem winders. I mean, he goes right at people. Okay, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. See, he's talking to Israelites. The God of our fathers hath glorified his son, Jesus. So he emphasizes or puts out there Jesus' divinity. Then he says, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Pilate was going to cut him loose and all you denied him in front of Pilate and that, that led to him to be crucified. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life. Now here's the gospel, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. In other words, when you crucified Christ, you really didn't know what you were doing. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. In other words, his crucifixion and his suffering, his passion was, was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it had to happen. It had to be done, because God said it was going to be done. 
And then look what he says. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So he, what has he told him here? That Jesus is the Son of God. He's God. He's deity. That you guys killed him. That God raised him from the dead. And that you need to change your mind about him so that your sins can be forgiven. Well, that's the gospel, right? That's, that's all he did. He preached the gospel. We talked last week. Some people will tell you Peter's gospel differed from Paul's. It's not true. It's, they're the same gospel. This is the same message Paul preaches. It's the same message we preach. Now, he's speaking specifically to Israelites, and so he keeps putting it in that context, right? We don't do that. We have a different context. We're talking to Gentiles. Okay? But, um, but it's the same message. And then, at the end here, in verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, this is a dis he, he, he slipped some dispensational truth into his message right there. He said, the Lord has to go back to heaven until the times of the restitution of all things. He's describing a dispensation. That's the kingdom age. Okay, When everything is put under Christ's authority on earth. And so he says, and that's been pro that event has been prophesied since the world began. He's talking there about Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. There's all kinds of Old Testament passages about it. And he's referring to that. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now he's quoting here out of Deuteronomy. Jesus is that prophet. There were other prophets like Moses in the Old Testament who filled that office. Okay? But Jesus is that prophet. He's the specific one that was being referred to in this prophecy. We know it from this. Okay? Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye, we see who's talking to you, ye are the children of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So he's telling the Jews here, change your mind about Jesus Christ, get saved, and, uh, you know, if you do, in a, in a previous sermon we saw, he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation, right? Get yourself out of Israel before the judgment falls. Separate yourself from rebellious Israel and into believing Israel. That's the way they saw it. Okay? Church is not Israel. But the early church, they were all believing Israelites. Okay? And so he tells them this, and you can see them. So what does he tell them? First, that the, that the miracle was done by the power of, of faith in Jesus Christ's name. Whose faith? The man's at the gate? No, he didn't know anything. It was Peter that called upon the name of Jesus Christ for him to be healed. And the Lord did it. Peter says, I didn't have any power to do it. Because it wasn't my power. It wasn't my holiness. It was through the faith of the name of Jesus Christ. And so it's a sign that, the, that Jesus was who he said he was and that he truly was raised from the dead. Amen. And that's what Peter's telling Israel here. Now you've seen this, you've got no excuse. That's what he's telling them. Right now, moving on to chapter 4, and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, everyone knows the, the, the main point of Sadducee doctrine, right? They don't believe in anything supernatural. And as Pastor Starr used to say, I don't say it every time because it's funny, that's why they're sad, you see. Okay, they don't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, they don't believe in resurrection or any of that. They're basically what today we would call liberals among Christianity. 
or Unitarians, you know, people who just don't believe anything. United Methodists, bunch of knuckleheads. Um, you know, but having said that, it's, I was watching a, a video recently about that nonsense going on in Seattle. And you know, one of the leaders in there is a Baptist preacher from some Baptist church within there. It's probably ABA is my guess, or ABC. Um, and of course, it's a woman. She said, that what a wonderful thing this, I think she called it CHOP or it's Chaz, whatever it is. She said, uh, this, is, this is a beautiful thing where we can show the whole world how to live without police and live with love. Well, she's a moron, okay? First off, we really have no business in that. Our business as churches and church leaders is to be reaching people with the gospel. Amen. That doesn't mean you can't defend your rights. I'm just telling you, our business is to be doing that, not to be getting on the camera and talking about the things that are going on in the world. But second, and more importantly, that nonsense up there is just riot and insurrection. That's all it is. It's not anything good for anybody, even the people carrying it out. I know they think they're having a good time, but it's not gonna end well for any of them. But she's in there helping them along, shameful. Okay, but that's basically what the Sadducees were. They just didn't believe really anything. Okay, um, but they were very religious, very upstanding. They gave a lot in alms. They knew the text of the Bible. They just didn't believe any of it. And by Bible, I mean the Old Testament. Okay, now, so there, verse two, it says, being grieved. They were upset, they were angry that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's what really got the Sadducees going. Later on, we'll see Paul, he's in big trouble because he disobeyed God, is what happened. And he got himself into a place where he's cornered by a bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees and they want to tear him limb from limb. And he gets them all fighting each other over this very thing. Over the resurrection of the dead am I called into question this day? And then the, the, the mob starts fighting each other. The Sadducees and Pharisees go at it. Okay, well here, the Sadducees were in charge of the Sanhedrin. The high priest at this time was a Sadducee. And so they're upset that these men are preaching the resurrection of the dead, that Jesus rose from the dead. Because that's a miracle, that's something they deny outright. Just like Unitarians and United Methodists and liberal Christians do, because they're not really Christians. In verse three, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. So, they locked him in jail overnight. That's a nice how do you do. You heal a man, tell the truth, and they throw you in a prison cell. Nice. <laughs> Keep that in mind when we get frustrated with how we're treated. I've not once been arrested or even threatened with being arrested for preaching on the street, for handing out tracts, for going door to door. I've been yelled at, I've had people tell me to get off their property, I've had water put on me and stuff like that, but none of that matters. Um, it's nothing like this, where the cops show up and cuff you up and put you in jail. That does happen in parts of the world. But we're blessed, it doesn't happen here, at least not yet. Uh, but it happened to them, and then in verse four, how be it, many of them which heard the word believed, and look at this, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So a week before, uh, or a short period before, I'm not certain exactly how far, but a short period before, 3,000 people got saved on one day. Now, 5,000 plus, because this, that's just talking about the men. So I don't know how many it was, but it's well over 5,000. We're talking about a church going from 120 members in less than a month, likely, to over 10,000. That's a big jump, yep. okay? Big things are happening here. Well, there's a reason for this. This was a, this was a new dispensation. We talked about how the day of Pentecost was a one-time event, right? Where God created this first church and, and uh, verified his message to Israel, okay? Well, this first church had a big job to do. It was to plant churches all over the world. Wow. And God's equipping it with the people to do that, okay? This miracle here was the sign that Peter then used to preach the message of salvation to Israel, and over 5,000 people 
accepted the sign, believed the message, and got saved. That's that's a lot. <laughs> okay. Now, these are miraculous events. I don't think they get repeated today. That is not to say that anyone should doubt that God can save 5,000 at, uh, at a whack, because he can. He's capable of that, and it can happen, I guess. But you have to understand some things. These folks, when they were preached to, who were they? They were Jews, right? They were Israelites. Did they know the Old Testament? They did. They understood the law. They understood who God was. They understood about sin and sacrifice. They understood the lost, their, their lost condition, the need to, to have a sacrifice to deal with their sin, because all that was built into the law in the Old Testament. It was part of his uh, Jewish doctrine. So when Peter preaches these messages, he doesn't have to do any spade work. You understand what I mean? He doesn't have to teach them very basic things. He can quote and refer to the things they know and put it together in a short, fast message that goes right to the heart when the Holy Ghost takes it there. And so when we preach to people, usually they're just out and out pagans. They don't know anything. They, now, I know this is a country in which the Bible and, and, and the gospel and Christianity and Jesus Christ are commonly referred to. But believe me, people don't know anything about it. And so you have to get them lost before you can get them saved. And then you have to, to get them to believe that that lostness is a problem that they cannot solve, no matter what. That, that it's a real problem. You know what most people think of when they say, yeah, I'm a sinner, you sure I'm lost? You know what they're thinking in their minds? God is love. He's not going to throw everyone in hell. And I know I'm better than most people. That's what they're thinking. That's, how, that's what's going through their mind. And so you got to get them past that. And, and so our work is, is, is more difficult, candidly, um, as far as getting a clear message to the listeners. It's less difficult in that we don't have our government busting up our meetings and, and throwing people in jail. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that there are rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. I just point out that this high priest was not, he was in the office of the high priest, but he was not a proper high priest. He was not a descendant of Levi, and he was most definitely not a descendant of Aaron. Okay, he didn't have any right to this office. They had purchased it from Herod. By they, I mean Caiaphas and Annas, because they would flip it back and forth. They shared the office over a period of years, exchanging it back and forth. Verse 7, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now see, we're going to see again the sign to Israel and its leaders. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel. There we go. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the court. That's the kind of thing, by the way, that could get you killed. Saying that right there. He's quoting Old Testament passages at him and, and saying that they, they rejected the Messiah. He's making him, them out to be the bad guys in a Bible passage. And they're supposed to be the religious leaders. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now that is as sharp a message as you're going to get. And he gave it right to him full bore. This is what we mean when we say that these, were, that these miraculous events were signs to Jews and to Israelis. Okay. Um, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. I know everyone in here has heard sermons off that verse. It just simply means that they knew things that they shouldn't really know, but they knew it because Christ had taught it to them. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Because there he was, healed. Challenge any charismatic preacher to do that. Bring someone who's been lame for 40 years from, from birth, never been able to walk paralyzed from the waist down. 
heal him, and then show him to us, standing. That challenge has been made many times. It's never been responded to. And you know what they say? Well, you have to see with the eyes of faith. Well, but that's... You're telling me you have sign gifts and miraculous powers. Those could be seen with the eyes. To see with the eye of faith is to believe in the power of God when he's not doing those things. And of course he's not. They're liars. Very, it's very frustrating how they play with the words. But anyway, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So they knew that they had done the miracle, they knew they had done it through that name, and they don't want anyone else healed. That's their decision. We don't want to see anyone else get any benefit from that name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now this is a, a legitimate government command. They had the authority to issue this command under their form of government. But notice what Peter and John say. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the thing, things which we have seen and heard. So they refused the order. Now, remember, they just spent the night in jail for preaching in his name and for healing a man. They could very well have been executed over this. But they didn't back down. They didn't dissemble and deceive. They just said, well, yeah, we're not doing that. He told us we can't preach in his name. We're going to do it anyway. If you've ever, ever read this day of Baptist history, there's an account of a Baptist preacher in, I think, South Carolina, thrown in jail, who preached from his jail cell because he wouldn't pay the licensing fee that the state tried to make him pay. He wouldn't pay it because he said, you can't license me. You have no authority to license me as a preacher. I'm a free American. And they threw him in jail. Well, he'd stand at, his, at the jail cell window and preach out the window. They, tried, they told him he couldn't do that. They beat him. They put him in stocks. They fined him. He refused to pay the fine. Other people wanted to pay the fine for him. He said, no, absolutely not. He stayed in that jail cell for quite a lengthy period of time before the magistrate finally just got tired of it and then let him go. When I say lengthy period of time, it was months. Separated from his family. He would not give an inch and he wouldn't stop preaching. They kept telling him he wasn't allowed to preach. And he kept saying, oh, well, I most certainly am. And so um, that's what Peter and John were like. They were told something, told not to do something God had told them to do. Something that the Lord Jesus had specifically told them to do. And they said, I'm sorry, we're, we're gonna obey the Lord. They weren't obstreperous about it. They just refused. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. So I'm going to stop there. Now, my point in, the, in going through this is to... The dispensational understanding of Scripture explains why there were miraculous events that occurred in the early church that have not been repeated. But because people don't understand dispensations, they want these things to continue on. I, well, of course, I want them too as well. It would be awesome if we could heal people at, at a touch and do, do these kinds of things. But God has not called us to that. He's called us to live by faith, not by sight. Amen. To pray and trust. And so um, we have to explain, we have to cover why these things happened. And that's, what, that's why I'm doing this. Everyone understand? It's, it's part of the dispensational understanding of how the church got started and why the book of Acts is written like it is. Pastor covered this to some degree the other day when he mentioned in chapter 13 everything changes. Well, it does. It's all really Israel up to chapter 13. And then it's mostly Gentiles. There are Jews involved because everywhere Paul went, every city, he went to the synagogue first. But after a period of time, when the whole synagogue wouldn't convert, he'd pull the ones it had out, 
and go start gathering Gentiles up. And in most of those churches, all over the Greek world and the Roman world, the bulk of the people were Gentiles by the time Paul was done and moved on to the next city. So it changes as you move through. Uh, but the first 13 chapters are really about Israel. It's true, Gentiles get saved, Cornelius and his group, and it is true that some Samaritans get saved, and we're gonna look at that. Um, and that's just the keys of the kingdom of heaven, or king, uh, yeah, kingdom of heaven being used by Peter uh, to open the door. That's all that is. Um, and we'll cover that. So, um, any questions? All right, you're dismissed. Yeah,